Hey there, short film fans. Welcome to another episode of the Cameo Launch Short Film Podcast. I'm your host, Nigel Morgan, and joining me today is a guest who's going to give us a great, great episode. Uh, we came across, uh, we unknowingly actually came across his work a few years back as he produced the um, short film Double Tap. And he has since gone on to write, produce, direct uh, feature films such as Host, Dash Cam, Scare Package 2 and a number of others. He has a unique and remarkable filmmaker journey and I think we're really all going to get a lot out of this episode today. So if you would join me in welcoming Jed Shepard to the podcast. Jed, thank you so much for joining us today. How have you been? I've been good, thanks. Thank, thanks for having me, Nigel. I appreciate uh, everything. No, no, thank you for, for taking the time out. I can see from the uh, the work you've been doing, you've been incredibly busy. And um, as, as we mentioned, kind of off camera, uh, we saw your talk at a recent event in London and just really blown away by your story. Oh, thought, thanks, man. We, we, we've got to get uh, got to get him on the uh, on the show. <laughs> and have Appreciate that. Um, yeah, because, you know, I think a, a lot of your origins are very similar to a lot of people out there that are trying to get films made that have made short films that we've um, reviewed as well as people that have gone on to the festival circuit or people that are just you know trying to build up an online following it's it's very very similar to those but you after having kind of had that that initial kind of origin story took a very unique path would you mind talking us through a little bit of how you got into film initially what were some of your initial inspirations and what were some mm -hmm. of the projects that you that you set out to to do at that, those initial stages yeah well like like a lot of people in, in the UK uh, you don't really know that being a filmmaker is a real job. You, well, you, you turn on your TV, you, you turn on Netflix, and you just watch things. You, and they're mostly foreign, they're mostly American, they're mostly, you know, it, it, if you're a little bit, you know, uh, if you're like challenging things, it, it might have subtitles. You don't understand that films can be made here, really, uh, growing up. At, at least I never did, because I barely ever watched British movies. And so. You know, once you start getting into something, especially myself, I get really obsessed, and I was just obsessed about filmmaking and and horror specifically, really, just mm. from a very early early age, and I became completely entranced by it. And one of the reasons why is because I'm, as I mentioned, when you saw me last week or a couple of weeks ago, it was um, uh, just my mum is from Philippines and she believes in a lot of these, uh, you know, monsters and ghosts and ghouls and the supernatural, which uh, right. it, for Filipino people, it's an everyday thing. It's, it's not something you see once in a lifetime in the shadows. These are things you see up front and close, maybe on a daily basis sometimes. Um, and you do everything you can to kind of ward them away. And, you know, that was, mm. that was in my head the whole time uh, that monsters could be real. So growing up, I, I you know, I, you know, put myself in, in the position where I would read a lot of things about horror films. I would watch loads and loads of horror films from a very, very early age. And it just made me think, wow, these are just blowing my mind. I was always a curious kid. So then obviously you learn, you want to learn how they're made. Mm. And, you know, you, you get to learn a little bit from like making of documentaries and things. And obviously you, YouTube was a big help, but we didn't have YouTube when I was a little kid. So, I guess the whole thing started for back in two thousand and ten, I would say, or eleven. There was a the very very first film I was involved with is a terrible horror movie called Birdemic Two. Right. Yeah, and uh, pe people don't even realize I'm involved with that, but yeah, I, I co-produced it. It is the sequel wow. to one of the worst movies of all time, <laughs> and. I it, I was just obsessed with it. people who know Birdemic know that it's a, it's a cult film. It's mm. it's terrible, but it's a cult film. So I was obsessed with it. So I forced my way onto that production by telling them that I will help get it released in into cinemas in the, in in Europe. And I had absolutely no idea how to do that, but somehow I managed it. I literally just called up cinemas all over Europe and was like, "Hey, got this weird film. Do you want to show it?" And you know, a lot of them did. So that's how I got my name at the start of a of a 
sequel to like a, one of the worst movies ever. And right. then I, I wanted to make short films. And uh, again, I didn't know how. I didn't go to film school. I didn't have a network at that point. But I found a collaborator in, in a guy called Rob Savage uh, on Twitter. He posted a, a, a one-minute comedy short that he did. I think he got one retweet and two likes. and But it, somehow it crossed my path. It was fate, really. And I said to him, hey, this is really cool. We should, we should go for a drink and talk about movies. And uh, that's what we did. And uh, in that very first meeting, in fact, it might even be the first sentence I said to him was, hey, I've got this idea for a short film. <laughs> and that ended up being Dawn of the Deaf, which we, we made uh, a few years later. Right. So together, me and Rob, we made three short films, and each of them progressively more uh, interesting, renowned, I guess, and, and a little bit more expensive. But we managed to, to like make a little bit of a name for ourselves and build a network of like-minded people, people mm. who believed in us. And uh, yeah, eventually that whole team helped us make the features and, and the stuff we're doing now. That's amazing. That's brilliant. And, you know, th- this actually speaks to some um, common experiences that we've heard from a lot of filmmakers who we've spoken to mm-hmm. in that the projects they've been able to do and the way in which they've been able to kind of build on previous successes and, and do bigger things is very mm-hmm. much down to the community that they build around them. Yeah. Um, and just kind of the, the as you say, like-minded people that, that get attracted to that enthusiasm along the way. Um, talk to us a little bit about Dawn of the Deaf, actually, because I think that's one of the, yeah. the films you mentioned at, uh, at the talk that we saw you at. It sounded like yeah. a really interesting premise. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I'll give you the premise first. And I'll talk about how it came about. So so the premise of Dawn of the Deaf, uh, it obviously started with the name Dawn of the Deaf. I think just one day I was watching Dawn of the Dead, and I just realised that dead is one letter away from, from death. I was just like, okay, well, what would that film look like? So it started with a name, and then I worked out the story, and then I tried to make it myself before I'd met Rob, actually. I tried to make it myself, but again, I had no network. I, I didn't know anyone else who, who, who made films. So, you know, even though I'm in London, you know, the, one of the, the best cities in the entire world, I just didn't know any film people. Hmm. And then, yeah, this was back in 2010, and I met Rob in 2000, yeah, I think in late 2010 I, I met Rob. And then as soon as I told Rob this, uh, my idea, he was he was completely sold. He was like, oh, we have to make this. But it was so ambitious because it's about a sound that happens, that kills everyone in the entire world. And the only pers- people who survive are the deaf people because they didn't hear the sound. But then everyone else, all the hearing, they rise as essentially zombies. Right. And, you know, this it sounds like the most slocky kind of film ever but you know it got us onto Sundance it, it, it was one of those things that just for some reason it carried really well and went into a million film for every big film festival you can think of it got into and uh, we screened that and it just blew everyone away and I mean we made that with our own money like I think mostly my money because uh, I, cause I had a job so um mostly my money and the way we kind of uh, added to that supplemented to the money we had we got an extra few grand or two and a half grand from the central school of speech and and casting in 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 london because you know our money probably wouldn't have traveled very far back in those days so and this was 2013 14 i would say so we so we spoke to the central school of speech and drama and we said that if we used some of your students, would you give us some money? And they said yes. So we auditioned a bunch of people, and the people we found were uh, Redina, Haley, and Redina, Haley, and Caroline, who all ended up being in Host, right? And some of our other stuff as well. So that's how we found those three ladies. And we had, um, yeah, you know, it was just so lucky that we found those those three because they were amazing in Dawn of the Deaf. And it was an amazing experience going to Sundance with that. But, you know, they've been amazing, amazing friends ever since. And, yeah, pretty much nothing we'd ever do 
like like host and dash cam things like none of that would have happened if we hadn't have done dawn of the death first and, and met those ladies and learned how to craft uh you know a beautiful story even though it's a schlocky tile a mm. beautiful story that um you know people seem to connect with yeah yeah and what's interesting about that well number one you've got a title which is obviously a play on a well-known movie. Yeah. But at the same time without, well, I, don't, I wouldn't say without meaning to, but without advertising it, I suppose, or without telegraphing yeah. it, mm-hmm. um, you've done what a lot of people now are running to catch up to do in terms of representation, right? Because, yes. you know, immediately, just by virtue of the, of the premise, your mm-hmm. main characters are going to be people who are deaf, yeah. Um, and putting them front and center in a in a um, in a horror story or in a story where they are going to have to rely on their wits or mm-hmm. their, you know their courage or or you know or whatever. Yeah, um, and that in itself is is a super clever and b it speaks to the kinds of people who make that kind of movie because yes, you've yeah. got the the fact that you know you've got a group of people who are making a film and okay maybe this is a way to gain a bit of experience or if I help out on this production, I'll get some credits or whatever. But the fact that it is a film which by its by its nature um, speaks to representation, speaks to the type of people who are making it as well and gives that sort of extra message of these are people who, you, people who you'd want to work with, not just an opportunity to get a credit. Yeah. Which then leads back to what we're talking about in terms of building a community and building a team which, which takes you forward. Which I think is is really really interesting and is a fantastic way to to push things uh, push things on. So mm-hmm. you mentioned that having done Dawn of the Deaf, you know that was sort of a bedrock project, which allowed you to then move on to the feature films that uh, that you ended up doing. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about how you ended up doing uh, Host? Because I think that was a bit of an unusual story as well. Yeah, so so between Dawn of the Deaf and Host was another short film, I'll just tell you about it quickly, called Salt. And it was because of the success of, of Dawn of the Deaf in terms of critically acclaimed and at festivals, we just won every award you can think of. We were given the opportunity to, to make a short film that for, for the first time ever wasn't our own money. So we got given <laughs> some money to, to make something. They, and they were just like please make us you know something like dawn of the deaf you know critically acclaimed and and you know a, a, a cool idea and i came up i while at sundance i actually came up with salt and did and this is a genuine story we came up with salt me and rob we were on this shuttle bus from a screening um, and if for those who don't know sundance is in the middle of the mountains and when they put sundance on it's like minus 15 degrees. It, it, it was really, really cold. Wow. And we didn't know. We thought, you know, it's America. It's going to be sunny. So we turned up with like no layers. So <laughs> we got, so it was like three in the morning and uh, we got off the shuttle bus and we realized we'd gotten off in the middle of nowhere, quite far away from where, from where we were staying. And we were like, oh, wow. When's the next bus? When's the next shuttle bus? And there was nothing. And we're like, okay, this is interesting. So we're in the middle of nowhere in the mountains, and it was like three in the morning, and it was minus 15, probably minus 20 degrees at that point. We had no layers, and we were like, oh, we should just really not stand still. We need to keep walking. So, like, we were like a little bit worried. We were like, okay, this is how people go missing. So we just started walking literally into the mountains, me, me and Rob. And I was already quite sick that day, weirdly. So, I was fading fast because I was tired. I was sick. We just watched a terrible movie. And we just started walking. And we saw in the distance there was like a ski lodge. Um, so we that's kind of the direction we were heading into, the ski lodge in the distance. But by the time we got there, it was, it was closed. It was like the wrong season or something. I don't know. It was just closed. So Rob was like, okay, this is really bad. Like we we could potentially die here. So like in order to um, keep our spirits up, we, he was just like, okay, let's just think of movie ideas. So as we were walking along in the in the snow, and I was literally just wearing like dunk like Nike dunks uh, in in the snow up to our waist basically, and and I was sick, and he was just like, okay, come up with a movie, and I and I just said, 
a, a siege movie in a in, in a salt circle. And he was like, okay, tell me more. And I was like, okay, a woman and her daughter have to draw salt circles around their bed every night to stop a demon coming in and taking the, the little girl. And he was just like, cool, that's it. And, you know, the, the, the good news is we got home, obviously. We found a way home eventually. And then he was just like, I can't get that idea out of my head. And we, when we got the signal that someone wants to make this, uh, give us some money to make a short film, that's the first thing that came to mind. And then we made it and we put it out and it it, it did better than Dawn of the Death. It, it, it just blew up and it was like immediate, like all of Hollywood, all the Hollywood studios came calling, like literally every single one of them was just like, we need you guys on our team. So this is prior to, prior to host, like the year before, me and Rob went out to um, Hollywood essentially, and 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 we, you know, we we had meetings with everybody, and we we did deals then with James Wan, Sam Raimi, uh, Studio Canal, everyone. We 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 just did deals all over the place, all various different films, and that was based off a short film, and and obviously because they liked Dawn on the Deaf as well, and the very very first one we did, which for three hundred pound was one called Absence, which kind of no one talks about. And then, based on that, uh, we were we we were you know planning to do multiple films, and and then COVID happened, and then it brought everything to a grinding halt, and we just thought oh, this is over, the momentum's gone now. So we you know, especially Rob. Rob was in a real like dark place. He, I think he was very depressed that you know the momentum stopped, and I always try and put a, a bright spin on things. So we were keeping busy. We started this, WhatsApp, which I mentioned the other day, we started a WhatsApp group called the Quarantine Movie Club, which was just a WhatsApp group so our friends could, you know, organise what time we were going to meet online to, to watch a movie on Netflix or Amazon or, or Disney Plus at the time. And um, so every day we watched movies and, and every day I, I made a poster for that movie, I posted it in the group chat. This is what we're watching today. This is the time. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, we just watched every terrible movie you can, you, you can think of to distract us. But then we started running out of movies. We, we, we watched every single Patrick Swayze movie possible. And, uh, yeah, I think we, we generally watched Ghost twice. Oh, really? Um, yeah. I worth it. it. Yeah, worth it's, it. it's definitely worth it. Yeah. And then Rob, you know, I, I guess out of boredom, he called, and, and, and at the time Rob was going out with, his his girlfriend was in America filming Loki, um, oh. uh, K- Kate Heron. So you know he was bored at home by himself. Uh, we we lived on the same road at the time, by the way, as well, which is which is great. So we had um, so Rob called me and said, "Jed, I'm, I'm going to prank our friends or everyone in the Quarantine Movie Club." And the Quarantine Movie Club had maybe seventeen people in it, twenty people in it, right, and okay. they were people that we've worked on in, on previous short films, um, essentially. And he said, I want to prank our f- friends. I'm going to, and he showed me what he wanted to do. And it was all on Zoom. He would go up the steps to his, he would, he's been selling this, this kind of like conceit the whole time for the last like couple of weeks that there were, he keep, kept hearing a noise in his attic. So he's like, okay, this is why I was doing it because he's going to go up to his attic. Someone's going to jump out at him and he's going to fall down the stairs and die all on, on Zoom. And he showed me what he was going to do. And it, it to be honest, it, to me, it looked terrible. I was just like, this is the worst thing ever, Rob. Like, don't do this. This is this is this is cringe. But like, you know, he showed me a bunch of times, and I gave him suggestions what he could, what uh, I think he should do. And then, then he was just like, okay, cool. I'm gonna do it tonight. I was like, cool. So we said to our friends in the group chat and quarantine movie club, hey everyone, let's all jump on Zoom at six p.m. So. You know, but it, they didn't really want to because it, it just seems weird because it wasn't to watch a film. It wasn't. It was just like to hang out. So, you know, there were people were reluctant to come in into the Zoom because you know busy busy lives. Yeah. Um, but they eventually they all came on. Actually, Gemma was the one that took ages to come in. I had to I had to message her and call her like six times. Gem, I think you should really come into in, into into on the Zoom today. So came on. He did it. It somehow convinced them. And we got a, basically a reaction to him dying on Zoom. And luckily, I'd pressed record like 30 seconds before everyone came on, onto the Zoom chat. And I sent Rob the the raw footage, and he edited it into a two-minute prank video. 
silly prank video and he put it online and it got 18 million views in two days. Wow. Nice. It, it was yeah it, it was insane we, we, we were just like what is going on oh, and then off the back of that the we had just because people had known us for short films so, so people thought this was a short film we had all these offers from all these different production companies and, and, and crazy. streaming services saying hey mate where's the f- you've obviously got the feature idea for this and if anyone asks you if you've got a feature idea you just say yeah sure say yeah, yes. definitely. Yep. <laughs> so so rob calls me and says hey jed uh because I, I i've I, i'm the one that comes up with our, our ideas every time so he calls me and says, okay what's the idea for this one and i'm just like i have no idea man this is <laughs> it's it's not like a short or anything so so eventually, like, you know, I was racking my brains all day. And as I mentioned the other day, in, at 4.30 in the morning, it just came to me just somehow, like, and I, I don't know how, and I wish I could recreate it because I would do it again. But just <clears throat> I text him two words, and those two words were Zoom seance. And, and that was it. And I fell asleep, and I woke up the next day, and he was hyped about it. And, uh, yeah, and then so he spoke to all these different places and said, Okay, we're gonna make a. We want to make a film. Uh, we're gonna make it on Zoom. We're gonna make it with our friends, and all we've got is Zoom seance. And then, surprisingly, everyone wants to give us money to make it. But Shudder were the only ones who wanted to give us the money during the pandemic. Right. To make it. So everyone so, else wanted to wait till after the pandemic to yeah get into production. Right. Okay. Exactly. Everyone else wanted to, wanted to wait till after because they were like, "This is a great idea," but you're not going to be able to do it during the pandemic. And we were like, "Well, not only that, we want it out." Before the before lockdown ends, and at the time, Boris had told us that the lockdown ends on August first. So we were like, it has to end on July first. Th- it has to be out by July thirty first. Right. So Shudder were the only ones. Shudder is a horror streaming service. They were the only ones who who was like, yeah, sure, here's the money, go do it. Wow. So yeah, so we wrote it, made it, and did all the posts within a twelve week period. Yeah, and it was out at the end of, the, of those twelve weeks. 12 weeks. Yeah, from start, wow. from start to finish. That is amazing. From the time I said Zoom, Zoom seance to the time it was out, it was, it was 12 weeks, pretty much exactly. And uh, yeah, and from that point, you know, it, and we, we didn't even know what we had. The, the cast, they just thought, you know, it was a bit of fun that we did, like, during the pandemic. And actually, a couple of them, were, they were just like, oh, maybe I'm going to promote it, maybe... Because you know, they just thought it was like a like a silly thing, um, but it, it blew up beyond our wildest dreams. Like within within twenty four hours, and and it was you know it's at the time it was Shudder's biggest ever hit, and they were really unknown in this in in the UK at least until Host came out, and then everyone started subscribing, and yeah, it just blew up. Then we were on BBC Breakfast, we were on ITV News, we were on you know all the um, American news networks, and we were, we were all over the place. And me and Rob were being interviewed, and Gemma Hurley, other co writer, we were everywhere. It's, yeah, it, it was an insane, insane time. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. That is quite possibly one of the most original origin stories for any movie ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it? It's gone into law now. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's crazy and, it, and yeah. it's slightly unrepeatable as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say because that's that's kind of where your path kind of diverges from a lot of uh, a lot of filmmakers. Um, mm-hmm. as, as we were talking about at the top of the episode, you know, a lot of people are out there. You know, that you're trying to get short films done and get them seen and so on. And you had um, great success with that. Obviously, um, people's success with that tends to vary. Uh, yeah. But this particular story is where it completely diverges because I don't think you could ever have planned to do it and I don't think it's the kind of thing that you could do twice. Yeah, right? exactly. But I will say that the reason why all of these places trusted us to make something mm. is because of our short film. So, you know, right. we, we, we set the table for them to, to put the meal on. So, yeah, it was like 10 years of making short films and networking and finding our amazing team who were like all our friends and you know the, 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 that's the great thing. Like we, our, our, you know, our first success was a film we made with our friends with no interference whatsoever. Yeah, and yeah. you know, it's uh, officially 
according to uh, science, the scariest movie of all time. You know, it's already in like top 20 horror films of all time lists on like you know, Empire Magazine and Total Film. It's already up there and it's, it, it's crazy. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it is. But at the same time, you know, I think that's that's one of the, the key lessons to take away is mm-hmm. that, um, the, as you mentioned, the, the foundation to that was short film. Mm-hmm. And, you know, short films that clearly weren't made with a financial objective in mind. They And it's impossible to plan for things like festival acceptance or any awards won or any of that kind of thing. It's literally yeah. you get the best idea you can. You get together the people that you can get out of the network that you're able to build and you just make something that ultimately you just you just believe in creatively. And yeah. you put yourself into it because you believe in because you believe in it. And yeah. but exactly. you know, to ultimately how how it's received and how well it does is essentially up to the universe to a certain extent. You have to obviously apply your craft and and get as good at it as you can be. Yes, um, but it's that's kind the of hard bit. that's it, the it, hard part, right? Yeah, it, it takes decades to be, to become an overnight success, and, mm. and you know the how we were able to move so fast and and and, and write so fast and, and create something so original. So fast as, you know, decades of watching horror movies and, and, and studying them and, and learning our craft through, through these short films and just finding the exact right collaborators. Like, you couldn't have, like, if me and Rob hadn't found each other, I'm pretty sure none of us would be in film right now. Like, maybe Rob would be be, be doing adverts and things like that because that's what he was doing mm. prior to me meeting him. Or maybe he would be teaching film somewhere. But having a career making like you know he just he just directed the Boogeyman, you know that's like that's like a you know fifty million dollar movie, right? Amazing. It's, it's and two years ago we made we made host. So you know like who who knows what would have happened if we hadn't met each other? It's just mm. really like I, I reached out, and that's the beauty of you know reaching out to people who you like on on social media, mm. regardless of how many followers. I think Rob had like twelve followers at the time. There is no um. You know, there's there's no harm in reaching out to people who you think are talented, yeah. and uh, you want to collaborate with because you never know where it might end up. Yeah, absolutely. And social media is not a metric for creative potential. Mm-hmm. Remember that one, kids. True. But what I do find interesting is that when you did start to garner that attention and people did start come knocking at your door, it was uh, Hollywood, not the UK film industry, that yeah. uh, that came looking for you. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that, actually, because when you are working in an independent space, generally speaking, and I'm being very, very general here, um, genre tends to be a um, a, a reliable um, area to work in because it mm-hmm. lends itself to high concept. It makes it easier to sell to a potential investor or studio in a pitch yeah, as opposed to complex character drama which is what the uk film landscape tends to like however what we have found um, and what i think people will find if they do a little bit of studying walk into your local cinema your local multiplex and i challenge you to find your uh i challenge you to find more than one british movie in there if any yeah Mm -hmm. yeah Uh, so you as a british filmmaker how is it, or why do you think it is that it is so difficult to find the same level of success domestically as you have found in uh, in America? In the UK, we don't have the infrastructure um, to to make horror movies here um, repeatedly and and, and successfully um, because f- even though horror films are you know, big box office, it, like they're always like the biggest movie, along with superhero movies, they're the biggest box office and they're the best return on investment. If you look mm. at like the top 20 best return on investments ever of all time across the world, they're horror movies. Like like most of them, 18 out of the 20 are horror movies. Mm. And there's a reason for that. It's because you don't need big names. You just need a good concept uh, you need to execute really well. But, you know, People are buying into the concept rather than the star, um, which you know saves you a lot of money. You can make things very, very cheap. If you look at something like the Blair Witch Project, it was yeah. made for pennies and, and you know made six hundred 
million, seven hundred million. We we will we will hardly ever have that kind of thing over here, just mm. because people in charge, people with the purse strings, people who run the film funds, they do not want to uh, put money into horror movies, and the reason why is just plain snobbery. That is it. The and I mentioned it, I mentioned it in, in the talk the other day. The BFI, I think, have a lot to answer for. The, the British Film Institute have a lot to answer for. They do a lot of good things, and there's a lot of good people working there. So let me make that clear, first of all. But the, mm. the secondly, the people who make the decisions on where to put the funding mm. need to be completely changed for the good of the f- film industry and be replaced by people who are more open to making stuff that people want to see. It's public money. It's funded by public money, but they're not making uh, films for the public. They're making movies that they believe will win awards, BAFTAs, BIFFAs. And those type of movies, uh, costume dramas, and what I call poverty porn, they're just you know looking at the, the worst aspects of the UK and you know showing that in a, in a way where people are entertained by it. And I don't think that's great. Mm. Um, and then you've got costume drums, these big ensemble movies that cost loads of money, never makes a profit. So these movies just never bring money back into the system. They'd, and, you know, they pat themselves on the back, they pick up their BAFTA, they hold it up on TV and it's like, thank you to everyone involved. We couldn't have done it without you. But they have killed the the... Our film industry over here. You, you you go into any school in the UK and you say to everyone, "Okay, what's your top five? Who are your top five British directors?" No kid will be able to tell you like <laughs> their top mm. five British directors. If they can name one British director, then they are like on the ball. But I doubt they would. And that is so scary because we were the we were the best uh, back in the fifties and the sixties and the seventies and the Come early eighties. Ham horror, Amicus. We were, mm. we were making these amazing horror films that w- would would play worldwide, and unfortunately, that that ended with our snobbery, our British snobbery, and that has killed our film industry. Which means that you know there's generations of people um, who are growing up not knowing you can you can make films um, because there was no path. There's there's nobody they can see that they can go. Oh, okay, I want to be like that person because we just don't have it. Our TV. Mm. Our TV stuff is very good, uh, yeah. So that that's a good thing. We, we we make great TV. We export overseas, but when we make films, we just you know we we take our foot off the uh, off the pedal a little bit, and we let every other country take us over. Mm. So yeah, so one of the things that I'm trying to do with with the platform that I have now, the small platform that I have now, is highlighting this, and and I feel like I'm the only one who's saying it because people are scared that they're going to be blacklisted by you, you know. The, the British film industry. And I'm just like, what British film industry? Mm. Like, <laughs> like, it's dead. It is completely dead. And the people who try to convince you that we have a thriving film industry are complete liars. Like, just look at... like I can only base stuff on what I see, who I talk to, and, and evidence and stats. Look at the films we make. Do they make... Do they ever make a profit? Do they... Do people know about it? Do they, do they travel well overseas? No, they, they don't. And it's because we have been conditioned to believe that the f- we have to make films over here that represent certain certain things. And, you know, art, art films, essentially, films that win awards. But that's not what people want to see. The general public want to be entertained. They want escapism from, from, from their lives for, for, you know, 90 minutes. And that's the kind of films I want to make. You know, films that inspire people, that make people want to go to the cinema on a Saturday night and jump up out of their seat, popcorn flying everywhere. That's the kind of movies I, I, I want to make. And, you know, because the Americans make that and they make a lot of money and they're very successful doing it. Mm. And every other country does it too. Japan, yeah. South Korea, France, even Ireland. Like, uh, actually, Ireland supports genre movies they're really good with genre movies and like some of the best horror movies of, of the last like 10 years have come out of ireland but not 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 the uk and and also and this is why we lose we lose all of our best filmmakers to to america if you look at people like ben Wheatley, yeah. for instance like you know as soon as he has a bit of success he goes off to america and he makes he makes the make too 
Edgar Wright. He goes mm. off to America and he makes like Baby Driver or or, or whatever. They mm. barely ever stay here and make films here because we don't have the infrastructure here and you can't get funding here. Yeah, I, yeah. This this to me is is key to the journey of most filmmakers ultimately because from mm-hmm. a purely business perspective, you as a filmmaker are the manufacturer of a product essentially right Mm -hmm. that product is manufactured with the understanding that there is somebody at the end of this production line waiting to purchase that product now the 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 outlet for that product is cinema irrespective of what anyone says about the changing landscape and streaming and new outlets and so on and so forth the things that give weight to online content in terms of film is cinema so that mm-hmm. is basically where where the um, attention is. It's where the value gets added and, and so on and so forth. And we need to kind of be looking at that in terms of why there's no money or no support at the development end, at the um, funding yes. end, right? Because ultimately people are like, well, where, where, how am I going to make my money back? Well, when it goes to cinema, well, nothing actually gets released in the cinema. So, well, I, I um, take on board everything you said about the BFI, and I think there's a lot to be examined there. The other aspect I would like to have a look at is why cinemas feel there is no value in buying into British film. Because if because one has to assume that cinemas and the BFI talk to each other, right? And the, and the other aspect of that is, is the BFI as an organisation filling its correct role because I think it should be an organization that supports film. But the fact that we look at it as something that's supposed to fund all of our film, that I think is also part of the problem. Because again, going back to America, you've got a lot of private entities and private companies. Um, even the ones that kind of came along in sort of like the 70s, 80s, like your Canons and your Orions and your Corolcos and all those kinds of guys. And mm-hmm. you know, some of the, the a lot of those guys aren't around anymore, but you know, you still got your big studios, but they're private entities. And they've kind of seen that there is a business model in X type of film or Y type of film. They'll fund that, they'll release it, it either succeeds or it doesn't, and so on and so forth. But there doesn't seem to be that kind of mentality here in the UK. And as a result, all of the uh, the aspiration for funding or the expectation of funding to get a film made without really much attention on whether or not it gets seen, then falls on the BFI. And ultimately, you're still talking about one group of people, one small group of people, ultimately. So is there something that needs to be looked at in terms of our cinema landscape? So our audience, our views, our empires, Mm -hmm. our cine worlds, um, and the types of films that they ultimately say, okay, we're going to screen these ones. Because one of the things that really became clear to me, particularly during the pandemic, is even though, you know, we we were in sort of those midpoints where cinemas were allowed to open or public services were allowed to open with certain restrictions. As soon as certain films Mm -hmm. out of Hollywood decided they were going to get delayed, the cinemas just shut again, even though they were allowed to be open because they're like, well, Hollywood's not sending us anything. Therefore, let's just shut it all down. But where was the where was the domestic stuff? You know, where where was the, the where were the British films that could have kept those cinemas going? Yeah, um, it's funny you say that. Quality. Actually, you know, when the cinemas opened again uh, because of the success of of hosts on streaming, we had a lot of offers from cinema chains to to show hosts, like you know, when the when the doors opened again. Um, so, to be fair to the BFI, they were the first ones to um, them and the Prince Charles cinema were the first ones to say, "Hey, we we want to show, we want to show host." We, we, we want to welcome people back to the cinemas by showing host. But then, you know, you also have to think me and Rob had gone to the BFI so many times for funding for our mm. short films. And yeah. every single time they said no, because it's horror. No, 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 no. They just weren't interested in helping us whatsoever. But then as soon as it was a big hit, you know, they claimed us. Mm. You know? And again, I like the BFI. I actually like the BFI. I like the people there. I like that. Obviously, they're they're doing good for for the film industry in terms of like knowledge 
um, archiving things like that, and you know the the cinemas are, are, are great, but it's just that one as- aspect is 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 not great at the moment. Um, and they you know they know that they get a lot of criticism online, but you know let me back it up with a, with a couple of facts. The if you go on their website, and this information is freely freely available. Go on their website. They have a list of all the films that they've ever funded, ever. Okay. Yeah. Actually, it goes back to the nineties, I think. Just, just, just export that list into a spreadsheet mm. or wherever you want. Filter it and see how many films are horror movies, like actual horror movies. There's like out of like the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, there's like four horror movies, right? And then mm. they are almost quasi horror movies they're not really straight horror movies but i'll give them like i'll give them that four five horror movies and the one that people cite the most is his house you know it's a recent critically acclaimed hit i love his house great movie great director well written people hold that up as a way to say hey look they do they're starting to change they're funding horror movies Mm. But then I know the real story because the producer of his house, he he messaged me on Twitter and said, hey, the BFI didn't fund us. We went to the BFI for funding. They rejected us. So we had to get funding elsewhere. And then once we got the funding, they came in and gave us a little bit of like finishing funds for post. And then they stuck their, their logo at the start of the movie. That's mm. the situation with the BFI. So right. I can't give right. them credit for, for, for his house. And I'm, I'm actually, I, I don't believe that the cinema chains are to blame for the, for them not showing the horror movies. I just don't think we are making enough quality horror movies because the investment isn't there. If the investment was there and the infrastructure mm. was there, then we would be able to make quality horror movies that could be shown theatrically. Mm. I think so. I don't actually blame yeah. the cinema chains too much. I, I blame the lack of infrastructure, the lack of resources, knowledge, and the fact that I don't believe that filmmakers in the UK work together enough. I, I believe we think that there is a limited amount of resources that we have to share with tens of thousands of people. Mm. Um, and yeah, so you know, everything that I've ever done has been funded from America. Because mm. they they believe they believe in horror, they believe in taking a chance on, on people. We don't get that over here, unfortunately. Right, right. It's kind of a catch twenty two in that scenario, then, isn't it? Um, without the yeah. funding, then you can't really create the quality horror films. Without without that, then people aren't going to provide the outlet. Without the outlet, no one's going to invest in it. Without the investment, you can't create the horror films. Yeah, I tend to be of the opinion that it speaks to a deeper problem culturally within the UK in that irrespective of the national pride we tend to tend to display, that deep down in terms of who we are as a country right now here today, we don't actually have a lot of faith in ourselves. Because if we did, I think there'd be a lot more in terms of, um, as you say, infrastructure, but that infrastructure is something that tends to form a lot of the time organically from a lot of people kind of um, getting involved in a particular type of enterprise. So if there were if there was more mm-hmm. general faith in terms of what we can do, what we can uh, make, and who we can appeal to, and I'm not I'm not even talking international. I'm just talking domestically. You know, British films appealing to British people, being able to put them on a, in a British cinema for a British mm-hmm. audience. I, I think if there were more general faith on that level, then you would have a lot more people actively investing in that kind of an enterprise. Again, going back to the the very in- event at which we we saw you, there were people who financed films there. And, you know, they love mm-hmm. the idea of being able to, to fund a film and, you know, being able to attend a premiere or put it, put it on a, a cinema. It's an interesting thing to talk about down at the golf course, all that kind of stuff. You know, they, they love yeah. the idea of being able to do that. But for whatever reason, it seems to be a harder sell when it's a British filmmaker making a British-based film 
um, with aspirations of showing it to a British audience. If you know you have the yeah. opportunity to to break America, as the, as the phrase goes, then people tend to be a lot more interested. But when the aspirations are domestic, I don't think the the enthusiasm is there, and I don't think the faith is there. Do you think there's a particular reason why that might be the case, or why either British film or British audiences don't tend to invest in the idea of of, of British made films for British British audiences? Yeah, broad question, I know, but yeah. Um, no, no, that, no. I, 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 I think I have an answer. The, the a lot of people, a lot of people with the money, like the private in, in, in investors, they are in it for a particular reason, and that's to. It's either like if we're lucky, it's because they want to make a profit. Therefore, you know, they'll want to invest in something they believe will make a profit. But in in most cases, it's because they want a, a big shiny award to show their friends and people know that horror films don't tend to win a lot of awards because the people on the juries are, are usually you know a certain type of person if you get what i mean and snobs mm. and we don't have people in these high places that are diverse open minded mm. um you know just just modern thinking and I'm I'm very com- I'm very commercially minded, and I, and I you know I worked in finance for the longest time before I was ever a, f- a, a filmmaker, so I you know I have a grasp of the business side of things and and how money works, and mm. I think that we are leaving a lot of money on the table right now, just in inve- yeah. investing money into the wrong projects. I think we need to first of all stabilize our film industry by investing. In, in movies that will make a profit that will yeah commercially minded movies and then we can reinvest back into the film industry and make bigger and better movies it's, it's mm. simple it's really really simple if we make commercial movies more people will watch it more people will pay for it our film industry will yeah. grow and then we can do all kinds of projects because they'll be the you know we'll, we'll start from the foundation of having m- more money and, and, and more success but right now it's just a complete mess and like if this was a longer podcast i could go into into the very detailed specifics of where it went wrong how it went wrong whose fault i believe it is who one knows it's fault it is you know it, it's down to a handful of people well why we're in this mess this film industry but i see the green shoots of hope like every day when i meet other filmmakers and like at that event there's some real cool people there real real cool yeah. people who understand what we're up against know what we have to do you know i don't have anyone to, to to look at in the uk and say oh that's the path we need to take that's the path i need to take that's very I, true. i'll just follow this yeah. path do that who, who is there there, there isn't anybody mm-hmm. so you know in america they have a million different people who can be mentors or or can point you in the right, right direction here we don't have anyone we have tv people we have real good tv people we don't have a large base of successful film directors here we don't not anymore yeah we need we need to you know tell stories from other perspectives not just mm. you know Hugh Grant in the middle of Notting Hill and you're not seeing a, a, a person of color for, for for two hours it's yeah, it, yeah. It, it's, it's just weird the kind yeah. of illusion that we we give off to the rest of the world it's not real no, absolutely, absolutely, and I think that that also feeds into our own self-image as well, because a lot of the mm-hmm. time when you do see British set film, it's usually either come out of or being filtered yep. through Hollywood in some way, shape, or form. Um, Notting Hill being a prime example—that's a Universal movie—and you know, most of the time you'll see a a logo of a major Hollywood studio in front of all of these so-called British films. And ultimately, it's really selling back an image of us that Americans have of us. So it's those parts of our society that Americans recognize yeah. and are familiar with and think will play well, and they'll sell it back to us. And as a result, we think that's the way that we have to be presented if we're going to be represented cinematically. That, that to me, is part of the problem as well. And the... The um, issue with um, cinematic representation is kind of exacerbated by the amount of access that 
Hollywood has, as opposed to the amount of protection that British film has. Um, there are a number of countries mm-hmm. in Europe, in Asia, in Africa even, that basically stipulate that a certain percentage of films being screened at cinemas in that country or in those countries have to be from that country. And the UK doesn't have that. Yeah. And without that, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not saying stop bringing in Hollywood films. I love Hollywood films. I grew up on Hollywood films. Um, in fact, mm-hmm. Hollywood films may want to be a filmmaker myself. So I'm not saying stop bringing them in. But when you have a scenario in which you have films made by companies who succeed in a market of 290 odd million people, when you bring those films into a market of maybe 40 to 50 million people, anyone making film in that market is just going to get outspent marketing wise. Anything that is going to be promoted, they'll, they'll, yeah, they'll just be out promoted essentially. So you kind of end up in a situation where even if you're making awesome films, even if you've been able to secure that funding and make a really good film, being able to get it in front of the eyes of the paying public is damn near impossible. I think that's a a huge, huge part of the part of the issue. But again, you know, talking about those those green shoots of hope, one of the things that has sprung up over the last, I'd say, five to 10 years is the visibility of short film is the mm-hmm. explosion of the amount of film festivals there are. And yes. as a result, the broad, diverse range of the types of films that you can see and who gets represented in those films. So if there is to be a turnaround in the situation as we currently see it, how big a part do you think short film has to play in that turnaround, uh, either at festivals or on, with um, online platforms and those types of outlets and how do you think those types of platforms can reach mainstream audiences to to try and increase that that exposure of of diverse film to to mainstream audiences so because people aren't given the opportunity to make uh feature films short films are really the in in this country i mean short films are really the only way they're going to get heard um so, uh, especially in genre, you know, I always, I always link it back to, to, to genre movies because that's just my passion. Mm. And it's the best way to showcase what you can do um, for, for less money and less of a, of a, of a, a time drain on whoever's going to watch it as well. Yeah. So I think making a short is really, at the moment in the UK, the best way to get your foot in the door. It truly, truly is. Um, I can't stress that enough. A lot of people say, oh, but people don't watch uh, short movies. The, the investors do and the studios do because they're trying to find the next big thing and they're trying to find the talent. You have mm. to prove yourself. The best way to do it is make a cool short film and put it into a film festival. Um, you know, Obviously, aim for the biggest film festivals, but any film festival is good. It'll get in front of an audience. It'll get in front of you know, interesting people. And then you can go to that fe- film festival, network with people in the, in, in the exact same position as you and, yeah. you know, make lifelong friends or collaborators that will help you get to the next step. It is essential. Like wh- when I see filmmakers now who are frustrated that they can't get their feature film made, I'm just like, mm. make it as a short film then. Make it as a short film. Prove that this concept works um, in a snapshot. And because, you know, it, it might not always translate very well, but with genre, luckily, you could, with a horror film, for instance, a horror film is made up of multiple like horror set pieces. Just shoot one of those set pieces as simply and yeah. as quickly as possible, and then you've got something to show and say, hey, this is what we can do. Imagine if we had like a little bit of money to like, do it properly. And, you know, I, I can't say too much, but like the short films that, that I've made and I've made as a, as a group, they're all being made into feature films now. And so, like, I'm living proof that it, it can be made. And this was before Host. We made those deals before Host. It wasn't because of the success of our feature mm. films that stand alone, like... And we made and we made those for very little money. Yeah. And, and you know, and I, and I need to remind people that Host and Dashcam, which is a Blumhouse movie, was made on iPhones. They, they were made on iPhones. The, the phone I have right now, the iPhone 14, is three generations higher than the, than the phone we made host on. Wow. Like, so, you know, everyone's got a film studio in their pocket now. I know it's a cliche, but you can, mm. you can really make cool stuff 
in your own home right now. That's right. No, that's that's wonderful advice and a wonderful journey and a a great place to to close it. We really, really appreciate the fact that you've taken the time to to share that journey with us. I think there's so much for people to to chew on with um, with everything that that you've spoken about. Just in terms of anyone who's not familiar with your work, um, where can people see the films that you've made? Where can they see Host, Dashcam and and the rest? And also your short films as well. Host is it's still on Shudder, but you can get Host anywhere. You might have to pay for it. Though. It was on BBC iPlayer for the longest time, but I think it's not on BBC iPlayer anymore. Dashcam, it's on Netflix in some countries. I think in America and Canada, but again, Amazon, it's on Amazon. Short films, just just Google my name and, and, and you can find our short films. Short of the Week or Vimeo under Rob Savage's name as well. You can find it. Yeah, and Scare Package 2 is also on Shudder. So if you've got Shudder, you can see Scare Package 2 and Host on there. So, um, yeah, and you can do a seven-day free trial as well. Mm. So, uh, yeah. yeah. And follow, really. follow me on social media, at Jed Shepard on everything. Fantastic. Fantastic. And uh, thank you once again, Jed, for, for taking the time out. It's been a wonderful conversation. I, I certainly have learned a lot from, from your story. I'm sure um, anyone watching slash listening will have as well. Have you got anything in development and what's what's next on the horizon for you? I'm, I'm attached to every cool horror thing that's coming out of the UK in the next couple of years probably has my name attached because okay. I'm really trying to help other people as well. Brilliant. So yeah. And you know, I, I just did a music video for, for a band called Ash called race the night. That's the song and it's a cool music video. So, you know, there's lots of stuff out there, but just follow me on social media and, and you can, you can see it all. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. We'll do. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people will be, uh, looking out for for your next project and we certainly can't wait to uh to see them when they all come out anyone yeah. wanting to follow cameo launch uh you can follow us on the socials that's at cameo launch on facebook instagram youtube and x um you can also sign up to our newsletter by going to cameo launch.com um you can also see all of the films review we've reviewed including double tap um, by going to cameolaunch.com slash reviews. Please do stay in touch. We love to keep people in the loop with what filmmakers are doing via our podcast, which you can also find at cameolaunch.com slash podcast. And uh, we'd like to thank you all for joining us once again. In the meantime, you all stay safe, take care, and we will see you next time. Thanks very much. Mm-hmm.